If you're familiar with my channel, you'll know that I normally test out some of the best performing cars in Gran Turismo. But what about the cars that don't perform well? Some cars in Gran Turismo are ill handling to say the least. So today we're going to look at one of these poor handling cars and see if we can make it into a track weapon. The Plymouth Superbird is regarded as one of the worst handling cars in Gran Turismo, and you don't have to look very far online to see plenty of people telling you that it is completely undrivable in its current state. But a good while ago, I made a video demonstrating that you could drive this car even at 200 miles an hour around Daytona, yet people still were adamant that its downforce was somehow reversed and those of us making YouTube videos were paid by Sony to hide these issues from the public. So I believe this issue is actually part of the game mechanics and I will show you how to fix it while also listening to the comments that tell me that the oval is too easy and that I need to prove this out on the Nordschleifer. There's an excellent video on YouTube of a Dodge Daytona in a wind tunnel and comparing it to a modern car, it actually doesn't have that much downforce. A Dodge Hellcat actually has about the same rear downforce as the Daytona with that massive wing. But the car should still be fairly stable, so why does it easily lose control and start to fishtail on the banking at Daytona? I've come to believe that this is actually a suspension issue and the key fix to this is increased body rigidity upgrades. The car at the limit of grip has movement in the suspension. You can feel the toe changing as you get to the limit of grip, and this causes the car to fishtail wildly. And if we look at the details of this upgrade, it makes the chassis more rigid and makes the suspension more precise. I believe this reduces the amount of suspension movement where your toe is actually changing at the limits of grip or when the suspension bottoms out. And therefore adding this upgrade will make the car much more stable at high speeds when it's fully loaded up in the middle of a corner. You can see by adding only this upgrade, the car is now much more stable on the banking and you can actually control it through the corners. I believe the biggest change this upgrade makes is it reduces the amount of movement in the suspension so that you don't get extreme toe movements under load. Combine this with higher ride height and even zeroing out the rear toe in the suspension, it will completely alleviate these oscillations that many people are experiencing with this car. But does this mean the car can handle well? Let's take it to the Nürburgring to find out. But more importantly, what's our benchmark for this lap? We'll need to target the lap time of another car with a big wing and a lot of power. And what better car than the AMG GT Black Series? This car has 720 horsepower and set the production car lap record of a 643.6 in 2020. It has massive amounts of downforce, modern suspension, modern chassis. So let's set a lap as a benchmark in game and we'll see if we can match it with the Superbird. And for this lap, I've upgraded the suspension on the car and also added the front arrow upgrade like they did for the lap record. And on top of that, this car has active arrow and sport soft tires to help assist it in producing even a faster lap time than the factory car in game. So now at the end of the lap, we come up to the line and it's a 642.8. So less than a second faster than the real production lap record. Now I've set up the Superbird to be the same weight as the AMG but we're down 100 horsepower from the Black Series. So to compensate for that, I've added the soft racing tires. So it will completely come down to the handling of this car to make up any difference in lap time, not straight line speed. So without further ado, let's get into this lap and see if we can match one of the fastest production cars in the world.
As we start our lap here, we don't even get out of second gear. I have the gears set very long because the torque of this car just makes it wheel spin so easy, so really lengthening the gears is the best way to put this power down. But you can see the car is quite stable, it is a little bouncy, and some of the curbs will upset the car, so I try and avoid quite a few curbs on this lap, but the car can handle some of them, so I just had to learn which curbs you can take and which ones you can't. And here we are at some of the high speed sections and you can see I'm not quite putting down full throttle but the car does turn and it is fairly stable even in the high speed. So while it doesn't produce that much downforce, I do believe the car is producing some downforce at these high speeds to be able to maintain grip and stability. I do have full brake upgrades, full transmission upgrades, a uh, wide body kit, about everything you can do to it. It doesn't have the front arrow air dam because I felt it created too much front grip. And the car right now is pretty stable at high speeds and that adds too much instability. It does bottom out occasionally and you have to be worried about bottoming out creating instability as well. So based on the adjustments given to you for the ride height, you actually have to run it quite high because it is just too unstable with the ride height all the way down at the minimums. It will bottom out the suspension and cause it to lose traction when that suspension actually bottoms out. It's not even an issue of the car bottoming out, it's actually the suspension bottoming out and sh putting a shock to the tire, losing grip. So now we've got the car coming through the Kesselson run up the hill, and this is really a turn in this car at the speeds it takes it. We're approaching 175 miles an hour, and watch here as the car bounces through this section, soaks up the bumps. It is a little sketchy, but coming through Bravery Corner here, it just has a ton of grip, using all the track there. Same here, just a light brake. And I wouldn't say this car handles amazing, but it does have grip and it can be driven pretty quickly and comfortably on this track with the right setup. In here, through the carousel, the car handles this very well. As we come out, we enter the handling part of the track where there's a lot of high speed transitions, yet we can ride the curbs, we can transition left to right, and the car holds on. It actually handles this very well, although it's still a bit bouncy and wallery as it is an old car and even though it has upgraded suspension, it's still very old feeling suspension with a lot of movement. And now we're coming down the hill to the Flutz Garden jump. Does it stick? Yes, we make the corner as we go over 100 miles an hour, short shift to fourth gear as we jump the second Flutz Garden jump and then immediately have to go left to set up for the Stefan Veloff S. The car wheel spins there as I short shift the fifth gear to hold traction. And now coming through the mini carousel, only a few corners left before the Dottinger hoe. And here we go, onto the Dottinger. And you can see the top speed here is not as high as it would be in the AMG, only 185 miles an hour as we now come under the Bilstein Bridge, down to the final big braking zone before the end of the lap, down to second gear. Now I did have tire wear and fuel consumption on for this lap, so you can see there's a little bit of red on the tires as they've lost just a tiny bit of grip, but we're coming through the final corner now. What's the time gonna be? Does it beat the AMG? Yes, it's a 641.8, so a second faster than our time in the AMG. So while it may not be the best handling car, it can be made to handle reasonably well and at least produce a decent lap time. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you have any suggestions for other videos that I could do in the future, leave them in the comments down below. I'll see you in the next one.